Bridget Peterson. Yeah. Um, I watched it on the plane. Did you? Yeah, on my way over here. I was just, I was I was pretty excited about it. I got the I I, I fell into the whole capital thing about it. Like I actually paid for the ticket. Did you? Yeah, yeah, I did it. And um, I tried to watch it on the plane, but the the signal was so bad, so it was mm-hmm. just like cutting off like mm-hmm. constantly. So I had to listen to it again afterwards. It kind of helped. Yeah. But um, what do you think? I, you know, I think it's really interesting and important. I think there's been a lot of critique of uh, Zizek for quote unquote stooping so low as to debate Peterson. But I think it's, it was an interesting and impo- yeah, important thing to happen. And I'm glad that Zizek's perspective is becoming introduced to a wide range of people and that it's introduced to Peterson's demographic and that they hopefully will be saved from uh, a more of a kind of like right-wing conservative position. And yeah. I just have to say that I'm sorry for being so mean, but I thought Peterson was awful. Yeah. I mean, you made this point that it's admirable that he has been standing up for the last few years and, you know, he has a a perspective that he stands by and that it's alternative. No, to... that's not that's not necessarily what I... Not, I wouldn't even use the word admire, but mm-hmm. just like what seems interesting to me about Peterson is that he's one of the few people that are trying to... That is trying to like articulate some kind of alternative, mm-hmm, absolutely. but it's kind of paradoxical because at the same time his whole thing is just like accepting the status quo. Exactly. And like capitalism is mm-hmm. the ultimate sort of like economic system, and like mm-hmm. there's there's really nothing else. So it's just like trying to optimize what already exists. Exactly. But when it comes to like personal life, mm-hmm. everybody's just kind of like we don't know. Mm-hmm. There there needs to be an alternative, including mm-hmm. Zizek. Zizek mm-hmm. is very much like somebody needs to come mm-hmm. up with a political alternative. Mm-hmm. You know, he does some things about like the historic discourse and all of that. But I think that I'll, most philosophers just kind of like, they deflect the idea of just trying to articulate like an alternative. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that Peterson is maybe a fool for doing so, but mm-hmm. he, he does it very unashamedly. Yeah, and, yeah, exactly. At least it's, well, talking about I'm an not honesty to it, I was going to say, at least there's an honesty to it. I almost don't think it, there's an honesty to it because it, there has been like a refusal to like accept that it's just a common garden conservative position, like a retro, a retro conservative, like the whole critique of the, um, the communist manifesto. The spark notes. Yeah, oh my God, it's like, what are you, 12? The, I, this sounds, yeah, I mean, I'm probably a bit mean about Peterson, but and as I say, like, I do admire, at least he's trying, like, I, I would be more critical of liberal identitarianism than Peterson. And at least he's try at least he's saying that like, you know, we need to do something about so it. Yeah, so here's the thing. I'd rather listen to somebody that foolishly sort of like asserts a specific position mm-hmm. than someone that like will self. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. That Zizek debated that it was just mm-hmm. like, so what are we going to do, Slavoj? Like, yeah, exactly. What are we supposed to do? Like, just kind of like being on the margins yeah. and like not really uh, uh, adding anything mm-hmm. to the conversation, mm-hmm. just kind of like poking mm-hmm. uh, the, uh, Zizek. But I don't know. It was, I'd rather watch this. Yeah, yeah. Than, uh, yeah. But it, you know, the, the whole... I, the thing that was hilarious, <laughs> as, and this is the, the main frustration that I've had for, with Peterson since he started to be, I started to, you know, listen to him and realize what he's doing, is that he's like shadow boxing. He's shadow, as in, he is casting a whole gamut of people as a certain thing when they're just not. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you're saying that. Um, He's actually just kind of like basically the status quo. Yeah. Just as the liberal identitarians are the status quo and they're two sides of the same coin. So he is angry with people who are effectively capitalist just like he is. And any the, the use of the word Marxist in his term just doesn't exist or the Marxist, the Marxists, you know, this. so he's been just completely using the wrong term and has created this imaginary foil when actually the foil is his own shadow, yeah. as in a different form of a capitalist. Yeah. Uh, so I thought it was great when it became clear 
when he, you know, so he heard uh, Zizek's intervention and was like, oh, well, hang on, you haven't answered this, this and this. It's like, well, he has, but what you thought that was isn't what a Marxist thinks. Yeah. So I thought that was good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if people were expecting to listen to this debate and come up with like, so who will win? Mm-hmm. It wasn't really about that at all. Mm-hmm. It was more just, because there was sort of like an impasse in their mm-hmm. communication because the target was the same. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> It was ID politics, or yeah. it was just like liberal people are like like hyper moralizers mm-hmm. because of a loss of identity mm-hmm. through uh, capitalist uh, estrangement, mm-hmm. and I think that they agreed on that. Mm-hmm. Well, for different reasons, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, I think it, it. Peterson was ready to to sort of like attack Zizek on mm-hmm. that specific point. Mm-hmm. And, he didn't even bother. I mean, yeah. Zizek didn't even bother, like, going to that. He just started talking about, uh, you know, other yeah. stuff. But uh, He just yeah. he did his, like, literal, usual intervention. Yeah. Exactly the same as always. I love the way he turned up in, like, a t-shirt and jeans. and did st- He turned up in, like, a t-shirt and jeans and didn't even, like, oh, yeah, yeah. Zizek with his, and uh, Peterson with his, like... The book. sweaty shirt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, just... Uh, what do you think about the fact that, that Peterson used the Communist Manifesto as, like... And like, here's the five reasons why the Von Rinas Manifesto is wrong. Yeah, he went to 10. <laughs> it was just, 10, uh, I don't know. I think he was like the type of discourse mm-hmm. that I think he's used to is like that whole, you know, with like Sam Harris or mm-hmm. Ben Shapiro, mm-hmm. which is very systematic, yeah. and, but in a boring kind of yeah. like ad- academic way. And uh, well, I think Zizek is one of the reasons why he's sort of neglected by the academy and stuff mm-hmm. like he's 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 just not like that at all i mean mm-hmm. he, i think he just like borrows from from a lot of different disciplines and like brings them together mm-hmm. and he's very like scatterbrained yeah but obviously worked because that was very i think disorienting for for peterson yeah that's yeah. interesting it's a good point i i thought you know to to like to take on to to just use the the communist manifesto to say like okay I'm going to analyze the entire herb of Ridley Scott based on the one ad he made for a charity when he was like 25. Yeah. It's very, very weird. And just, this is the thing that I do do find a bit worrying is that someone of that caliber could be like a tenured professor. Mm -hmm. I mean, the ability to like actually read a source and understand what the source you know, the, the, like the actual context of the source to read an original text and understand it, to be able to like differentiate between someone's early work and someone's late work, you know, the motivations of a, of a text. It, that kind of was a bit worrying to me. But I, I think that the fact, you know, it's not to speak to like Peterson's intelligence, but it might be just like an ideological thing that he just like, for, you know, all of that was just forgotten. So here's um, the deal. Like Peterson said in a video before mm-hmm. the debate that he got seven of Zizek's mm-hmm. books. Mm-hmm. Which is weird because then in the debate he said something like, well, he's mm-hmm. such an original thinker that I realized that I couldn't really yeah. like engage with his work in yeah. that amount of time. Just yeah. like, just read one book. One book, yeah. But it, it, like, it, it was very obvious that yeah. he didn't, yeah. he wasn't familiar. Like maybe he just like yeah. looked at a few videos yeah. on, on YouTube or whatever. But uh, that I think that was like the extent of his knowledge yeah. of like Zizek's work, not to yeah. mention like Marx. My God, just My like God. reading. Just like My reading. God. I mean... Yeah. If he, no wonder he discredits Marx so yeah. quickly because it's not an in-depth look at yeah, capitalism. Like Marx, is, like Marx is not the Communist Manifesto. Like that's a very specific text written for a very specific purpose at a very specific time for a very specific audience, i.e. uneducated workers. It's not like it, it's not Marx. Yeah. Um and yeah, like the the the, the leap from Marxism as in so he kind of understands Marx as like, okay, you have the people in power and the people not in power. So like, uh, re- he's basically talking about like resentiment. Yep. But and then and then like how that goes to liberal identity politics. Mm-hmm. And it, there were all these like givens. I have to say, I did. I listened to the first ten minutes intervention. So I like, please do critique me. I feel bad that I. It, just couldn't sit through the whole of the Peterson thing. So I'm giving like an opinion on like, I'm maybe doing exactly what Peterson's doing. 
<laughs> so like, I'm doing the communist manifesto mm. analysis of peace and from the 10 minutes, but there was a kind of thing of like a lot of givens in what he was saying. So, so it seems obvious to me that this leads to, you know, it, it yeah. is these kind of leaps of leaps of logic. Mm. Um, but I think, yeah, that, that lack of ability to be rational about it probably speaks to the fact that it's an ideological perspective rather than a logical one. Yeah, and I, he was also just kind of like, he was changing or shifting between mm -hmm. the Communist Manifesto and what he thinks is just postmodernism. Yeah. So he made this criticism at some point where he was saying that, like, you know, if you have, like, the dictatorship of the proletariat or mm -hmm. whatever, that how come at no point does it question itself? Like, it's not self-conscious mm -hmm. enough to, like, self-critique. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, I think he was saying just, like, you know, that the postmodernism is just, like, this disbelief in meta narratives or the mm -hmm. skepticism. It's like at no point are they skeptic, uh, uh, skeptical of, of, of themselves. It's just like Marx is not that type of thinker at all. No. Like he is making an analysis yeah. of how capital works. Yeah. And I think that if he would have read something like Capital, like, yeah. or or uh, he would know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it's not a proposition about like an alternative to capitalism. No. It's literally just analysis. Yeah. So it's not a meta narrative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's only it's like breaking down meta narratives. It's like. In fact, I think yeah. that maybe just capital is sort of like capitalism becoming self conscious. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, so yeah. Yeah. No. Exactly. I know it's. Uh, you're right. It's, just, it's, it's always like there's nothing much more to say other than like Peterson hasn't read the original text and has just like, what the fuck? Stephen Hicks. <laughs> Stephen Hicks. So yeah. what were some of your, what about when Zizek talked? What do you, what do you think? Yeah, something that I wanted to talk about was his idea of like the position of the hysteric, um, which we just listened to a talk by Todd McGowan. Uh, with some Belfast at the moment he's been over um, as part of this festival and we went to one of his talks um, and somebody asked a question about the idea of the position of a hysteric and so she did you know so in the in the 68 period the idea was that the ultimate position was the perversion and GJ is saying that the ultimate position is the hysteric but I actually think like it's got to be this hysteric plus the analyst like an analyzed hysteric you see what I mean? So like, uh -huh. like an well, analytical position in relation to the hysteric. Well, I think that it's not just like uh, the way that Zizek talks about it is not just like just the hysteric position, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. the hysteric discourse. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the one that is just kind of like, because there is like four discourses, like mm -hmm. the, 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 an, the analytic mm -hmm. discourse, the master discourse, the hysteric discourse, and then the university discourse. Mm -hmm. So I think that the, the analytic discourse is very different from the hysteric mm -hmm. because that the hysteric one is just like basically trying to get out of the master mm -hmm. discourse, like trying to poke holes on it yeah. and trying to yeah. find like that it's not, you know, this, this ultimate knowledgeable thing. Yeah. Uh, so it's interested in knowledge, but with a very different, um, with a very different end than mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. the analyst discourse. Mm -hmm. So the, the kind of the poking holes is like a, a questioning, a perpetual questioning. Yeah. Because I kind of think, you know, you raised a good point earlier today about, so the talk that we went to is about capitalism and identity politics and the idea that we have to have a universalist position rather than an identitarian position and that uh, a clinging to identity is a direct result of capitalism itself. But the thing that, that joins us together, the one universal is the lack. Yeah, the incompleteness of the subject. The, yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's what I mean, like by an analytic position. It's like, or an analyzed subject, as in, like in psychoanalysis, you come to confront the fact that you are a lacking subject. Mm -hmm. And as soon as we like, that's how we can have a universal. Yeah, is to well to to recognize the the failure of identity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think that. I think I, I think that was uh, Peterson's mistake mm -hmm. in, in, in the whole debate because he was saying that he was treating sort of like the working class or the proletariat mm -hmm. as if it was an identity mm -hmm. and it's not an identity yeah, exactly. because it's it can't be reduced to a particular. Mm -hmm. It's something that cuts across through everybody mm -hmm. because labor... That's the other thing. Uh, Peterson was 
saying that there's an absence of nature in Marx's uh, thought mm -hmm. and really just like labor is the way that Marx says that we relate to nature. Like mm -hmm. nature demands from us labor and that's mm -hmm. the way that we communicate with, with nature. Um, so it cuts across through all of humanity mm -hmm. and it can't be reduced to the particular. So it is a universal sort mm -hmm. of like a position. And, um, and I think that Zizek sees that you know, when you get to identity politics and all of this, like it's switching or, or trading the universal to for the particular. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. So yeah, no, Todd raised a really interesting point this morning about the idea that identity or a clinging to identity is what is like a direct reaction to capitalism itself. And that identity becomes like a release valve for capitalism to to perpetuate itself. And that uh, capitalism is almost at its most intense at its times of failure. So, uh, you know, after the speculative capital ended up in disaster in the 1920s, plus austerity from the 1919 agreement, Treaty of Versailles, you have a situation in Germany where you have Nazism. And obviously we have had a failure of capitalism post-2008. And that's potentially why identity is so strong. But also, you know, the, the, these periods where... Uh, capitalism has failed and uh, is at its most intense are also times that we can really, really question things. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess that's potentially why identity is, the question of identity is so, is so intense right now because we are at our most estranged. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we, we, but I guess this is the thing, you know, that like, the hysteric, the perpetual question of like, who am I to you? You know, so mm. the kind of the question of identity rather than the covering over of identity itself. Yeah, well, the way that I understand the the hysteric discourse is just like not who am I to you, but who are you to say that you are you mm -hmm. know you're a master? Mm -hmm. So it's it's directly tied to the master, mm -hmm. the master signifier, or sorry, the master discourse, and it's just like asking like all of this knowledge that you have accumulated, mm -hmm. like what is it, what does it amount to? Yeah, and like who do you think you are? And, and, like, and to, yeah you know yeah so to yeah to have that position and but one of the things that i i thought it was interesting is just that i think that peterson really he he finds this like the position of like authority mm -hmm. very interesting mm -hmm. and like to him it's just like you know it's it's what keeps the wheels of society yeah. like rolling and it's just like i don't know if he ever got to think like Okay, so the, it's it's very interesting, like, and it's something that Zizek said. It's like he was talking about like the hierarchy of like lobsters yeah. and like and all that. It's just like, but you know what? Like, even even the top lobster, like, he doesn't have any authority. Yeah. Uh, and I thought that was very interesting because, as much as like Peterson wants to cut through identity, as much mm -hmm. as he wants to with like, you know, Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. or like trans movements or LGBT, whatever. Mm -hmm. Like he's not willing to cut across like the like the authority figure like yeah. in quotations like yeah. of of like hierarchies yeah. like why wouldn't he be willing to just like reflect on that as well because mm -hmm. he should go all the way yeah and he should question like all types of identities exactly yeah. so it's almost like an identitarianism of like success or like capitalism itself like a doubling down on we are people who are successful under capitalism, you know, as an identity. Yeah. And, you know, the whole, we are the kind of people who self-improve and do, actually, um, I actually did download <laughs> Peterson's, like, self-authoring thing. I have, like, a terrible fascination <laughs> with this. Yeah. And it's, yeah, it's just, it's, it's just so odd to me as somebody, as, in, as, as he who has historically called himself a psychoanalyst. But this was when you were lost. Like, no, no, this was quite. Well, this was actually relatively recently. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was actually relatively recently. So you're still lost. Well, of course, <laughs> just, but like yeah. I don't care about the fact that I'm lost, you know. Yeah. Um, but no, just kind of like out of no, curiosity. I'm just kidding. But it's um, it is a nonsense. Like actually, I I didn't realize that it was his thing until I actually realized like, oh, I've actually seen this self-authoring thing. But somebody who, um, yeah, has called himself a psycho, quote unquote psychoanalyst, psychoanalyst, or at least has an, uh, like uh, an interest in depth psychology. It's like a series of questions, this thing, where you ask yourself like what you want to do and what you want to achieve and how you're going to do it. You know, not understanding that 
we are alien to ourselves. We don't even know our desires. You know, not taking into consideration the idea of like self sabotage. Yeah, I mean, it's it's. But again, I, I just can't understand how somebody like this basic. Yeah, is well, like a university professor. Yeah, again, like I just don't think that that was the issue for them. Mm-hmm. Like I don't even think that they disagree on that. Maybe for different reasons. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, I've heard Peterson say that a few times here and there. Just like, what do you know about what you mm-hmm. want? Mm-hmm. It's just like... You, oh, so he does actually... Yeah, he that. does He does do that. Okay. Uh, he's just like, well, you know, like, we don't know what we want. Mm-hmm. We don't know our desire. So he, de- I mean, he, he does, does it from yeah. like a union perspective of just like, uh, you know, we're just not identical to ourselves. And yeah. So he does do a little bit of that. Yeah. But I think the way that... I think where where they have fundamental differences is on their idea. For example, Peterson is like famous for this this whole video where he's just like, "What we 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 had a good laugh about that's just like if you think you're gonna oh, usher in the, sunshine, yeah, yeah, the yeah. communist utopia. I think again, sunshine. Think again, like, sunshine. Yeah. yeah so um, <laughs> I think he's. I don't know. I think he's trying to fit Marxism into this whole mm. kind of meta narrative, mm-hmm. but it's not even a narrative. Mm-hmm. A narrative is just like a, it's just an analysis, but um. I thought it was very interesting that they actually got to talking about utopias. Mm-hmm. And Zizek talked about, you know, just like, we should be, he was talking about immigrants. Mm-hmm. And he was mm-hmm. saying that, like, it's not utopic to think that we can live with with immigrants and mm-hmm. just, like, welcome everybody and, like, no borders or whatever. Like, the real utopia yeah. is to live under the ideology that makes you think that, you don't have to do anything about it yeah, and things yeah. will just resolve Absolutely. themselves. Yeah. And uh, yeah. yeah, And also yeah. not taking into account just like the way that the capitalism lives off of the production of immigrants. Yeah. 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 No, absolutely. The idea that, uh, you know, in this talk that Tom McGowan gave today is the idea of like tuning out and that the ultimate capitalist is the one who tunes out, who like goes off grid, you know. It's funny, there's like a big thing in, in the States, especially it seems like on, I see it a lot on YouTube, this kind of like millennial movement of like living off grid or like living in a camper van, like retiring early. Um, but that's almost like the most capitalistic thing. And this thing of like, oh, don't read the news, don't participate, just, oh, don't, yeah. just ignore it. But that's almost like, that's almost like the utopian thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That, yeah. that that's a possibility mm-hmm. yeah what did you think of when they actually started talking to each other after they yeah because he did like his greatest hits right yeah yeah. Absolutely. i'm actually glad i did because i don't know if you saw it but mm-hmm. on reddit and uh, a few other websites mm-hmm. like forums people that were very interested mm-hmm. just in, on peterson like winning mm-hmm. the debate yeah uh they started to say like, well, you know, he wasn't at his best, yeah. and actually, Shishik wasn't that bad. He was pretty yeah. good. So, yeah. there's a lot of people just making posts of like, hey, can you recommend mm-hmm. some books? Mm-hmm. And there's also a bunch of like leftists that are just like going into the like Jordan Peterson mm-hmm. subreddit and just being like, hey, if you like, Zizek, it's kind yeah, of annoying, yeah, yeah. but yeah. just like, if you like Shishik, like here are some books that yeah. you can start yeah. with and everything. But what do you think of when they were, you know, talking to each other already? Okay, so the parts that I listened to were the 10 minute intervention of each of them at the beginning and then Zizek's repost. I just skipped through the rest of it. But and you, the stuff that Jordan Peterson was talking and the bit they were chatting to each other. But you didn't, oh, you didn't watch like the, the, the very end? No. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Did I miss out? God, I'm terrible. That was really the best part, like, so, so tell me about it, what was the... Uh... Well, so there was a part, for example, where Zizek was just, uh, he kind of, pushed Peterson into a corner Mm -hmm. and was like, okay, so I've heard you talk about this and we should talk about this as well, like the Mm -hmm. figure of the Jew Mm -hmm. uh, within Zizek's work. But Mm -hmm. I think he said something like, you know, you're, you're often talking about this like Mm -hmm. postmodern neo-Marxist or Mm -hmm. cultural Marxist. Mm -hmm. You talk about them all the time. You say that they're, you know, like a cancer in society Mm -hmm. and whatever that they, they're like, that that uh, the universities belong to these yeah, people yeah. and like you know like they they're creating a discourse mm-hmm. that is just like putrid or whatever. It's like so he was like, where are these Marxists? Yeah, yeah. Like where are they? Tell me. And actually, Peterson was just kind of like he you know he mentioned something. I think he mentioned mm-hmm. like the hetero, heterodox yeah. project. Mm-hmm. Just like I mean, it was weird. I looked at the website and I was yeah. just like, what? Who are these? Who, <laughs> who are these people? people? Like yeah. it didn't even matter. Yeah. Uh, but he was just kind of like caught off his guard yeah. and. Uh, 
And at the same time, I think he mentioned like Derrida and Foucault. Yeah. And Zizek was just like, you know, well, are you aware that Foucault's yeah. like main target yeah. was Marxism? And he didn't even say anything back. So I'm surprised really? that he wasn't more prepared. Like, I, I, I just think, do you know what? I think that like, I mean, it could be a symptom of the fact that Peterson feels are so alone in the academy. The academy has been, actually, I'm not within a university, so I could be wrong. And I do know a lot of people at uni- who teach at universities who don't, who aren't of the liberal perspective, but they just don't say it. But he feels so alone <laughs> that he's like built up this whole like narrative around himself. And I think, yeah, no, it has it's, it's created this like fairy tale. But I mean, yeah. it, you know, that's not to say that these people don't exist, but what he's thinking of as Marxists aren't Marxists. In fact, they are capitalists. And the fact that they are the ones that are being spoken about suggests that they are useful to the capitalist project and the capitalist project uses identitarianism well it's not even a project the capitalist quote-unquote system you you know identitarianism is necessary to it yeah and it's necessary to it because we are so estranged in our labor as we are like individualized under capitalism so these where you were equalized right so like that that's one of McGowan's like, points in mm-hmm. in capitalism desire is just like, you know, they think that like the liberal dream is mm-hmm. to have like this sort of like equality mm-hmm. for everybody and and whatever. It's just like no, mm-hmm. it's actually capitalism that equalizes everybody, mm-hmm. and the hunger for diversity comes mm-hmm. in there like yeah. into play, and that, yeah. that's basically like you know the like the fault of uh, of identity politics. Mm-hmm. Like is that is that you know it falls into these things of like instead of being. Uh, instead of fighting for like a universal mm-hmm. uh, thing it's just like you know more diversity exactly so this is the thing that but, do you remember that meme that I sent you like, oh uh... yeah fantastic meme the best <laughs> meme I've ever seen so, yeah what, so what was it so like... it's a Lisa Simpson it's like a there's a a well known like Lisa Simpson meme she's like talking to a classroom and she's angry and right? she's angry and you like replace the you know whatever words are on the blackboard and it says yeah there was a guy maybe giving a lecture or something mm-hmm. it was saying like now the one percent like mm-hmm. owns or, or, or like the one percent or the top percent of the one percent is like Six oh, six men yeah. six men or something like six yeah. white men yeah. and then Lisa comes in she's like that's unacceptable like at least three of those women should, should be. be women of yeah color. So, so so it's like yeah the, the the leftist position is like yeah this six eight the eight men in the world own fifty um, yeah. percent of the world's wealth or whatever and then the liberals say that's terrible at least three of them should be women of color yeah <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah 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 I think it's interesting that um uh the the top I think this, I could be misquoting, but it's something like this, that the top four heads of the top five biggest arms dealers in the world are women. And the head of the CIA was some really high position in the CIA, women or whatever, you know, that, you know, as if that's a, you know, Captain Marvel was basically sponsored by the Air Force, you know, it's a feminist movie. (laughs) But it's, yeah, no, it's a, but again, the thing is that I think that's like a feminist movie probably nobody has ever heard of. Yeah. What's that? No, just Captain Marvel. Just Captain, just... Captain Marvel, yeah, this is <laughs> obscure, famous movie. Um, <laughs> but I don't know if it's the same, you know, capitalism has a tendency to capitalize on anything. So anything that's in public discourse as a critique of capitalism is capitalized upon. So, you know, the sexual revolution, capitalism, capitalized on the sexual, sexual revolution and just expanded capitalism into the realm of the bedroom, you know, using yeah. sex to sell, etc. Um and now we have the likes of Tinder, where you're literally like a product in a market. But capitalism has capitalized on the notion that, you know, identity politics became a notion that was a way to critique capitalism. But it's actually not. It's actually the very release valve of capitalism itself. And so, yeah, this this notion of, uh, you know, feminist discourse within like corporate ideology is just capitalism capitalism on any capitalizing on any critique of itself yeah. to sell itself which is why it's so hard to uh critique capitalism mm. and that really the only way to critique capitalism is through a universal universalist perspective yeah as in what we share which is why i guess you know the whole the whole notion of hierarchies is just like so distasteful <laughs> 
Well, it's just like, you know, you are completely you. Yeah. Like, whether you're a master or you're a slave, mm -hmm. like, that's what you are. Yeah. And there's no, you know, there's no element of chaos there. Um, that sort of displaces you from your position, mm -hmm. your supposed position. So, yeah, I mean, and I do think that just like the, the universal's position is this, you know, to, to acknowledge the incompleteness of the subject. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. embodies itself like in many different places that we don't, we don't uh, necessarily just like notice very, mm -hmm. very fast. But it's just like, uh, you know, in our relationships, mm -hmm. uh, in our, you know, ethnic sort of like uh, background. And, uh, you know, I, th I think... Really, and this is this is what maybe needs to happen, and it's like the analytic discourse mm -hmm. that, that well, actually, Jameson asked that to mm -hmm. to Todd, Todd right? Yeah. Like, do you think it's a hysteric position, yeah. or is there a discourse position that is is the answer to, for the universalist position? Yeah. It's just like no, I just it's, it's the analyst, yeah. and basically, it's just to go through symbolic castration. Yeah, it's yeah. just to distrust or like to 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 not recognize who you think you are in society, yeah. your place in society as a worker, as mm -hmm. a father, as a mother, or whatever. It's just like, all of a sudden it becomes strange to you mm -hmm. because you feel so alienated from mm -hmm. it because that's what that's what it means to be a subject. Mm -hmm. You're just like, you can't recognize yourself at some point. It's interesting, you know, that we have a lot of these um, in 2019 or post-2008 um, accumulation of identities. As By well. the way, we're saying just a quick aside. Yeah. When we're saying Jameson. We're talking about Jameson Webster. Yeah, she'll we, great we, writer. We will be interviewing her. Yeah. Uh, next time. Yeah. yeah. Well, who knows which order we'll release any of these in? But um, yeah, the accumulation of identities. So as a white cis, was that a cis? I don't actually. I don't think I have any other identities. <laughs> so white cis. I don't know. The most, the most persecuted. Like the like, least, yeah, like <laughs> the least persecuted. Um, you know, this accumulation of identities speaks to the failure of identity. That, like, no matter how much we try to harness or like st staple down a certain identity, it will always fail. So you get, you know, take an example as a non-binary Muslim femme. Fem, was Personal, it a femme fatale? Or was femme it? is like, it's like a femme. Fem, I, 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 I like, I'll get it all wrong, but like, you know, <laughs> yeah. person of, or yeah, another one, sexualities. How literally just what is a fetish becomes a specific sexuality. Have so, you heard of these uh, furries? Yeah, I have, yes. Yeah, oh my God, you know about this? Yeah, it's, it's, I'm sorry, it's just weird to me, I guess. Well, fetishes are really weird, but like, I just, you know, th so this infinite, like, yeah, it is. It, so this is we have these two arbitrary poles of man and woman, mm -hmm. or somebody who fancies men and somebody who fancies women. Like, okay, arbitrary. Like a number is arbitrary, a name's arbitrary, and of course you have deviations from it. But it's like going down into the absolute. I fancy table legs. You know, turning yeah. that into an identity. But yeah, the accumulation of identity speaks to the absolute failure of any attempt to. Yeah. Have an identity. By the way, just like maybe this goes a little bit off of the uh, of the main subject. Yeah. But I was talking to somebody the other day and she was saying that like, you know, it's just like she was complaining about, you know, the norms of beauty or whatever. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, just like, yeah. oh, that's a toll yeah. on women. Yeah. Some men or whatever. And I was just like, I don't think it is at all. Like, yeah, I don't think so. Because eventually, like what brings you together with someone mm -hmm. it's not necessarily that he looks like somebody in a magazine mm -hmm. or whatever like relationships like attraction mm -hmm. in relationships is it goes through fetish yeah. not through conventional yeah, sort of, of course, like you know yeah. so what you were saying is just like you know i'm attracted to her because her legs resemble yeah you know table legs yeah, yeah. not because they you know oh they're like whatever scholar johansson's legs or yeah, anybody yeah. Uh, so do you, do you agree with that? Is no, no, like... no, totally, totally. I mean, there's, like, there's no accounting for someone's, per you know, what I was going to say, perfection, fetish. Like, mm -hmm. No, but it's just like, it's fetish that orders attraction. romance. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, uh, yeah, romantic attraction. I mean, it'd be interesting, I'm not, like, I'm not an expert by any means, but it'd be interesting, you know, so in terms of, like, norms of beauty, potentially they come about because of 
a fetish of it at a given time, you know, like whatever they resemble some aspect of a mother. Or, you know, in some yeah. cultures, like large breasts on a woman are attractive and in others yeah, yeah, yeah. they're not, you know. Yeah, but it's just like yeah. whenever whenever anybody just talks about like, you know, oh, you know, I like guys that look like whatever, mm-hmm. Jake Gyllenhaal or yeah. whatever. It's just like, nah, nah. That, like, that's not what you like. Yeah. Like, what you should really be asking yourself is like, what's your fetish? Because yeah. that's eventually going to decide who you end up with. Yeah. Interesting. Um, I was going to say, so why do you think um, Peterson has been uh, so interesting to so many people for this past while? I think because of what we started talking about, it's just like he's saying something. Like, yeah, he's saying something. It's very similar yeah. to like Marie Kondo, where she's like, oh, yeah. you know, like clean your room. Or, yeah. or, sorry, no, he, he, she doesn't. She says like uh, order your room mm-hmm. or throw things out that don't spark yeah, happiness or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, so you had a really interesting point about that, that you think that's just like a capitalist conspiracy that we're going to end up having to live in such tiny spaces that they uh, want us to get used yeah, to. Yeah. <laughs> so it's basically just like the less things that you have, the less estate that you need. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you just need less space and it's like, you know, just kind of preparing people to live in pods. Yeah, you know, the Japanese of, style kind of like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think it's like I mean that isn't that the way that capitalism mm-hmm. just sort of like convinces people into its you know way of life is just yeah. like it's it's romanticized. Yeah. It's just like I have less things and it's romantic mm-hmm. to me because I'm like whatever I'm like unattached to like mm-hmm. uh, material objects and it's just yeah. but really what it <laughs> what it translates to to. And, and capital is just like, oh, okay, so you have less things, okay, you need less space. And, uh, it's interesting because like, uh, minimalism is quite a, you know, it's a, it's a movement which has some, you know, benefits and I totally respect it, but it can yeah. be quite a capitalist thing in the same, I think, I think you know, it's it, almost I, like, instead of accumulation, it's like, yeah, getting rid of is all being wealthy enough to not, you know. Yeah, I just think to, it's, yeah, I just think it's more of this sort of like, uh, self-management mm-hmm. or self-policing yeah. of yeah. like you know the, the the impotence that you feel from everything just changing so rapidly through capital is mm-hmm. just like what else do you do than yeah. hang on to identity mm-hmm. or self-management so, i know it's exactly self-management is a really interesting one and obviously uh, you know a moral policing and this is uh, part of the reason why i like ishijek so much is this like a reverence and his you know not falling into the trap of uh allowing yourself to be policed <laughs> Yeah. Um, but you know the liberal identitarianism is very much about policing thoughts and policing speech and policing um, you know it's, it's, it's kind of like a, a control of the individual and um, lots of things like vegan, you know there's nothing wrong with veganism in and of itself but the turning in a veganism into like a moral thing is like a protect the planet it's an it's the it's the it's a romantic part of it. It's a, it's a way to avoid actually questioning capitalism in terms of class and labor. Yeah. And oh, we're just solving the problem by basically being a, having a form of orthorexia. Yeah. You know, it's, it's with the release valve. You know, recycling. Yeah. Let's recycle individually our six cans of coke, but just oh, just continue mining cobalt in the Congo. Or, yeah. You know. Yeah, it's it's interesting that you mentioned the valve because mm-hmm. if you try to repress the you know your incompleteness as a mm-hmm. subject, it mm-hmm. will come out in another way. Yeah, in a way that is toxic. Yeah. So obviously, for a lot of identity groups, like there's extreme pleasure in being mm-hmm. excluded. Mm-hmm. So I think I don't necessarily think that the desire of a lot of like minority groups is. Mm-hmm is to be included mm-hmm. like actually i think that there's a sense in which they enjoy their exclusion yeah um and they want to keep things that yeah, way yeah yeah absolutely because once it stops like oh my god that would be the most horrifying thing yeah. and it's like this is this is where that thing comes up it's like the worst thing that can happen to you is getting what you want yeah so inclusion for like a lot of like minority groups would be the worst thing to happen because then you know it would lose its edge yeah absolutely yeah. i know that this isn't to say of course that a lot of groups that started off with a universalist project have been cast as identitarian groups or have become such. I think, you know, feminism in its early days was a universalist egalitarian project. But then you have to ask your question why it's called feminism. Mm -hmm. Um, Because often when you have a, you know, the word, these ist words, ableist means that you favor able people, for example. (laughs) 
<laughs> it's yeah. just interesting that it's called that. But you know, as in Black Lives Matter, egalitarian project at its core. One wonders whether, you know, the media has cast something like Black Lives Matter as uh, an identitarian project in order to rile people to maintain capitalism. Yeah. Um, you know, it's within capitalist, capitalism's, uh, you know, it's beneficial to capitalism for it not to be an egalitarian project. Yeah. So to, to cast it and to broadcast it as, as identitarian. Um, yeah, because the, the only the only way, the literal only way that I can see to critique capitalism is like a Marxist awareness of the change that you are in, an understanding of the system and a universalist project. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's capitalism, what is it, like, for itself. Yeah. 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 And I think that's, I mean, that, I think, I think that's just, like, Peter's biggest mistake. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That he sees, that he sees Marxism as a sort of, like, proposal to, like, replace capitalism. Yeah, exactly. It just never it's was not, that. It's not that at all. Mm-hmm. And in fact, like, one wonders whether, kind of, a universalist world would look economically, apart from it being fair, uh, that much different. Yeah. You know, as if everybody is, let's say everybody is able to go through psychoanalysis and no longer becomes like an accumulating subject. But you do things, you know, there, there, there are enough resources now and we have the technology to distribute resources and for there to enough to go around yeah. that it will, you know, whether actually us going to work day to day would look any different. Yeah, um, yeah so... That's so we've talked about Marxism because I think that the three the three topics happiness Marxism capitalism communism, communism, communism. or Marxism actually. Marxism capitalism happiness yeah so we talked about Marxism we talked about capitalism what do you think about uh, Peterson on happiness I think look you know I don't like his language mm-hmm. I don't like his references mm-hmm. I don't like the way that he talks about it and. Uh, you know, we, we don't like his voice either. <laughs> no. He does have a very strange voice. I also feel very, very guilty for not having sat down and watched the whole debate. You should but watch the end. In my defence, yeah. I have watched so many hundreds of hours of Peterson that I could have missed like a real gem in this. I feel yeah. like because often, you know, especially in the past, if you were to critique Peterson, you'd get this whole thing of. You haven't listened to, you haven't read his books, you haven't listened to him, you haven't done your research. If you actually listened, you'd realise that. Da, 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 da. But I think that's just coming from a perspective of somebody who doesn't know that there's an alternative reason. So I do feel bad that I'm commenting on this, yeah. but I haven't watched it all. But in my defence, I have watched hours and 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 pieces. Of- well, I mean, I think the cool thing about this, not cool, but it's just like unusual, mm-hmm. is that they talk to each other. Yeah. Right after Zizek finishes yeah. giving his whole thing, like they actually sit down and talk to to each other. So that yeah. that's and I think you know, that's just the part that was like worth the whole thing. Cause... And was and he like Peterson kind of understood that that there was a lot of I don't know if there's points of agreement, but you know, as in like potentially not systematic agreement, but points of agreement factually between them. Mm, I don't know. I don't know what was going on through mm-hmm. his through his head, but like, I do think that he eventually found out that he was out of his depth. Yeah. Uh, it yeah. does feel like at some point he took a dramatic turn to just kind of like I'm not admiring Zizek, mm-hmm. but just kind of like, okay, I'm, I'm gonna ask you questions and instead of just assuming your yeah. position or whatever. Yeah. So it was interesting because I mean they they were both kind of nice, although Zizek mm-hmm. was just kind of like. You know, he was maybe being a little bit sarcastic here yeah. and there, and yeah. like making fun of him in a way that was kind of subtle. Yeah. But yeah, I don't, it, but he deserved it. I mean, not for being Peterson, but just for being so because he he wasn't just Peterson; he was like unprepared Peterson. Yeah. Yeah. It's me for this podcast. I mean, I know there was <laughs> exactly there was a. I I have to say, yeah, that the 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 aspects that I the trouble is, I he was prepared for something that he thought. Ex- was what he was confronting mm-hmm. but that just do- doesn't exist it wasn't there yeah. yeah it wasn't there it wasn't there um yeah. but yeah when it comes to happiness what's your what's your hot take well on happiness? so i think it's interesting that so a piece does have kind of like a you know a uh 
a um, dissatisfaction edge, you know, it's an, oh, life shit, deal with it, sunshine, you know, whatever. <laughs> but there is a kind of like a teleology to his thing of like achieving something and getting meaning out of your life and ordering it. And I don't know whether happiness is the right word, but like certainly seeing the self-authoring thing, it's like these going after these things that, you know, will fulfill you potentially, but there's something that will fulfill you. Yeah. Um, And there's a slightly Jungian element in there of, you know, what you're meant to do, what your unconscious wants you to do, your subconscious or whatever. Um, But yeah, like happiness, I guess, in like a Lacanian sense, doesn't necessarily exist or exists momentarily, fleetingly. And again, this whole idea of like, not knowing what would make you happy, not knowing really what happiness is, that all these things elude us, that we don't know our own desires. Um, yeah. Yeah. I I do also think that they agreed on happiness mm-hmm. pretty much because they didn't agree on communism mm-hmm. because, you know, it, it was just like they had different targets. They also didn't agree on capitalism because mm-hmm. Peterson was just saying like, if you... He was saying something like, if you care about the poor, mm-hmm. capitalism is the best, it's the best, you know, yeah, it's the best yeah. system. Yeah. And, but they did agree on happiness yeah. Yeah. as that capital, sorry, as, that happiness is sort of just like an offshoot yeah. of something else. Something like, else, yeah. You dedicate your life yeah. to something else. Yeah. And happiness is just sort of like a coincidence or yeah. like an yeah. aggregate yeah. Yeah. to yeah. just like devoting yourself yeah. to something else. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, yeah, I think that was the, the part where they were just mm-hmm. mostly agreeing. In agreement. Um, do you know what I'm also just realizing? I uh, listened to almost all of it, I think, but I think that I, because Peter was listening to it and I listened to it loads when we were laying a vinyl for, for a film sheet. We had it on the background, but I was kind of like half listening to it. So I thought I'd missed a lot more than I had, but actually all of these points I did listen to, but I feel like yeah. it was just so unimpactful. I don't know why. Um, the other thing I was going to say, yes, yeah, so that point about capitalism, like if you care about the poor, then capitalism, you know, and, and, and raising people in the third world out, out of poverty is like a real fallacy, you know, that is is a is like an almost like a propagandistic point of capitalism, not taking into account that like, okay, yeah, you, you have two dollars a day instead of one, but how much does it cost to exist day to day now that there is more capital in this country? Like three times yeah. the amount. And also it's, it's just reductionist yeah. to wage. Yeah. Like yeah. what who who gives a yeah. shit about yeah. that? Like mm-hmm. there's so much more to to it that, you know, like what about like the dignity of the subject yeah, exactly. or just like you know the, the, um the rights mm-hmm. and all that stuff it's just like and that was one of his points it's just mm-hmm. like that's i think that's why he mm-hmm. didn't reduce it to labor mm-hmm. or sorry wage he reduced it to just like the problems that happen when you have the sort of like extreme inequality yeah, between yeah, the rich and the poor it's, like, it's basically like yeah. unlivable sort of states that yeah, create yeah, yeah. Uh, immigrants yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, this is something I think we touched on it in a different podcast in terms of, you know, how historically the uh, Industrial Revolution is seen as some is seen as a point of like great, you know, terrible oppression of workers and also great change. I feel like that that notion um, is something that is part of this idea that like, capitalism, uh, industrial revolutions help everybody and poor people. Out. But, you know, it that change only happened in certain countries because we were confronted by the horrors of the capitalist system and labors under the under those conditions that things change. Mm. Certainly we do not we are not confronted by the absolute horror of things when it's out there in the third world and that change doesn't happen. Yeah. That's not to say that you know there there aren't movements in those countries themselves but like what power do you have when you have so little? Yeah. Um yeah and I no, and also just yeah. like the way that he sees it is just like he thinks he thinks that the poor and the rich are just like holding hand and mm-hmm. walking towards like you know not a utopia but yeah. just a be- like economic betterment or whatever it, it doesn't work like that at all I know, like absolutely. you know like you know then then uh, you know the, the working class is like a stretchy hand yeah. you know because like yeah maybe they're they're walking towards a specific end mm-hmm. but the rich is going getting there like so, so much, much faster so and- but this is the thing that is if he if he'd read any Marx, one of the like basic points is the antagonism of capitalism. Like, and the antagonism is that the divergence of wealth happens to such an extent that capitalism fails. Mm-hmm. You know, when you have inequality, it's not good for capitalism. It's like one of Marx's basic points about 
how labour functions in relation to wage. If you don't pay people, you know, you don't pay people enough, they don't have enough money to purchase the products that the rich are making. Like, this, this, yeah, this basic notion was, of capitalism is just yeah, completely absent. That was the key thing yeah. that just, like, Peterson totally missed out on yeah. because he just fucking read the Communist Manifesto. Yeah. Surplus value. Exactly. Like, he didn't talk about that but at it's all. But this is the thing, you that's... know, it's a, a real point, you know, potentially the failure slash intensity of capitalism at this very point is because of inequality caused by speculative capitalism rather than actual production of products and how we didn't deal with 2008 and how the you know that the, those who f- footed the bill for 2008 were the poor and middle class and we are now does the level of inequality is inequality is insane and that that is a direct result of capitalism in and of itself yeah yeah, yeah. I'll be I'll be objective about it because we're yeah. talking about just like what Peterson missed. I think there's yeah. something crucial that Zizek forgot to mention. Okay. Yeah. Peterson talked about like lying. Yeah. So he was saying something like, find out where you lie to yourself mm-hmm. or to mm-hmm. others, mm-hmm. and then just don't do it. So what you know to be yeah. untrue, yeah. Just don't like, you know, don't uh, don't share that with other mm-hmm. people. It's like don't share the lie. I think that would have been a great moment for Zizek to go into his um, his Donald Rumsfeld thing about mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. no known 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 uh, yeah. you know, known known knowns and unknown knowns. Yeah. I think he would he should have gone into the whole like yeah. unknown known. So just mm-hmm. like yeah, okay, you know, you can go and like have this as a rule, but mm-hmm. at the same time, uh, we have sort of like the unconscious, mm-hmm. and it's just like we don't necessarily know what you know. What about denial? Yeah, you know, yeah, like. You know, you can believe that something is a lie just because you're in denial mm-hmm. or just because you want it to be a lie because mm-hmm. of your, you know, your unconscious desires mm-hmm. or your unconscious knows. Um, so, yeah, I just I just felt like you missed like a good opportunity there to go into that. I know. Thing. And I said, as I said, like a piece and calling himself like a at least a depth psychologist, yet just completely not taking into consideration the unconscious in relation to a lot of those things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for someone that's like yeah. a clinical psychologist and like a union yeah yeah he's just like he never talks about the unconscious like i've, I've, I've almost never I know, did, did you see, about... I did, like uh, as you say like the hierarchies and relating it to like the lobster it's like well no lobsters don't have an unconscious yeah like so no <laughs> no yeah i mean that's it that's the like he doesn't take into account that mm-hmm. you know humanity is a break from nature yeah absolutely and, uh, i know exactly it's like a it's a crack mm-hmm. um, and it, we're like we're like aliens compared to lobsters yeah. and you know as, again you know this is why evolutionary psychology is such an odd thing really as in it, no when it comes to like the psyche the self yeah. thought the unconscious i just don't you know there's a there's a, like a, a stop a stopping point there so what do you think what do you think the future is for jordan peterson uh he'll be fine do you think so? He's a businessman. Yeah. Like, I think that, you know, first he's a businessman and then he's like an academic. Mm-hmm. So I just think that this whole thing, like, he probably made tons of money from this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think he'll be fine. You know, the best that probably happened with mm-hmm. all this is just like to create interest in actual leftists, you know. And, yeah. and that, that yeah. was like, I love the way that Zizek ended. It's just like. If you're a leftist, mm-hmm. you don't yeah, have absolutely. to feel like if you have to become a liberal. Yeah, yeah. Like you don't have to get into this whole like identity politics things. Like in fact, like don't. I, in fact, don't. Well, don't yeah. via thought. Just yeah, like think exactly. for yourself. Like think. Do you know this through. is one of the main problems that I have with throwing out anything? You know, so one can understand. A, a friend of mine is a lecturer at a university, and she's telling me about how. Uh, trying to get the students to read Freud, it was like, it was almost traumatic for them. They wouldn't do it. They refused. And you can, I totally have empathy with students who are so burdened by debt. I mean, it's unbelievable. I feel like myself as a first year old, it was bad. Now it's even worse for, for students. You know, it's so, you know, the slow cancellation of the future. These people are profoundly traumatized and estranged by capitalism. So it's not surprising that people are, you know, reduced to identitarianism and that the this this form of liberal identitarianism involves the scapegoat of toxic masculinity or the white male. Um, 
hello again, welcome back. <laughs> we had technical issues. Um, I ran out of space on my laptop and I didn't want to buy another one. So I didn't realize it had run out of space and we were just talking to um, thin air uh, <laughs> for, for 20 minutes. So uh, we are here again to redeem that and talk into a microphone for 20 minutes. A day later because we... And if we... I, if we repeat ourselves, it's not our fault. It's the computer's fault, right? It's the computer's fault. Well, <laughs> it's my fault for being a total Scrooge. But I don't know. I like my this laptop I bought in 2015, and it turns out it's a 2012 model. So I feel a bit. It was the most up up to date Mac that I could have bought in 2015. That I feel a bit like hard done by that I'm screwed out of three years. So doesn't doesn't the, the like the Apple computers have? death drive inscribed into them yeah don't they die on you like, they do they um, definitely like, do they're like, automated to die the f- phones as well after two two years i've never had an apple phone that's lasted more than two years what is it that they they said that the battery dies or that it, it just stops functioning at its full potential it's or like something? electronic senescence i don't know it seems pretty um immoral i do i always wonder like <laughs> this is so silly this is this this like antagonism between like um, living, being of the world, and then also um, kind of examining the world that we live in, and thinking like, what if one day I wanted to make like a TV series, and I wanted to have it on Apple TV? <laughs> and like, the thing is, I wonder whether uh, capitalism is going to soon incorporate uh, any kind of critique of capitalism into capitalism itself. So, you know, the best capitalists will be the self-aware capitalists. <laughs> you know. So anyway, where were we? You were, so, uh, we were, talk- you were talking about logic and, mm-hmm. you know, that it's not fair just to not read somebody like Freud mm-hmm. because, you know, he had maybe some uh, sexist tendencies or like he's a white male. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. yeah, so the idea that um, basically I, you know, the belief that in the universal potential for logic and rationality and that those things are technologies and those technologies just like a car or like uh, medicine are things that can help us. Um, That's not to say that uh, other forms of uh, art and uh, perspectives on the world aren't necessary as well, and that uh, logic doesn't have limits, but a way that another technology that was developed through logic is Freud's work and psychoanalysis and a bearing in mind of the unconscious and a a, psychoanalysis is also a technology but it's a rational technology so just the point that i believe in the universal potential for logic and that um we should not let identitarianism um allow us to forget that well that was one of the nice things that zizek ended with Mm -hmm. is that you know if you're a leftist don't feel tempted to just blindly go into Mm this you know ideological thing of Mm -hmm. identity politics Mm and you know or just liberals in general and i thought that was like you know if for anything like the whole debate was worth it just for that yeah yeah yeah. because i think that you know and this is this is what one of the things that we said maybe even in the first episode is just like left of liberals Mm -hmm. and i don't think that that's a position that is very uh, 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 public mm-hmm. right now. I think mm-hmm. most leftists have been caught into this whole liberal mm-hmm. thing of like identity politics, mm-hmm. and it's not the same. It's just not the same. It's not the same. It's tempting because um, liberalism is kind of neoliberalism, and neoliberalism is capitalism, and we are all within capitalism, and it's very tempting to um, to do what is expected of us as a capitalist subject. And not, but, to, not to, no. sorry, just quickly, not to mention that the logic of the particular belongs mm-hmm. and has always belonged to the right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this whole mm. conundrum of just yeah. like, what particularity do you belong to? Mm-hmm. You need, the, you know, the right pronoun mm-hmm. of the particular. It's just like, it, you know, that's that's logic of the right. Yeah, and we have to remember that by by um, entering into identitarianism, we are uh, allowing, we are like releasing the pressure of capitalism and allowing it to propagate. And that uh, what, you know, so you look at someone like Malcolm X versus certain movements now, and they are structurally very different. And so it's not to say that a lot of movements aren't at their core <clears throat> egalitarian and totally necessary, but we just have to, it's not even, you know, like Zizek's point that like, um, 
you don't have to be an identitarian as a leftist. It's like, don't be an identitarian, as in be aware that identitarianism and capitalism are part of one another. You know, Nazi Germany is a prime example of a kind of collective identitarianism. And, it, you know, this was at a point where almost because capitalism was failing, it's at its most intense. So the failure of speculative capitalism and um, World War II uh, in 1929 plus 1919 austerity from the Treaty of Versailles, you know, this this leads to something like identitarianism. And, you know, it's not to say to blame people for entering into identitarianism, but to, like, get people to realise that we have already analysed and understood what causes these things. And it's like an analysis, you analyse a symptom, identitarianism is a symptom. So we should be aware of the symptom and ask ourselves why we have got to this symptom and what we can do to prevent the symptom from emerging. Mm-hmm. And so what what else did you think about the... Uh... Of the debate. Well, it's just something I wanted to say also about the idea of logic and rationality that certain um, people. By the way, just a, just a quick aside. Did you know that like Chapel Trap House wrote a book on like against logic and reason or something like that? I have to say. Because yeah. Ben Shapiro and yeah. all of these guys are like so into logic. And yeah, <laughs> this is the fallacy, okay? Ben Shapiro, Jordan Peterson. Listen to me, you aren't little twerp. <laughs> logical people. They use the semblance of logic. If you actually listen to the um, contents of a, a, a like an intervention by Ben Shapiro, it is full of holes, mm-hmm. full of you know an absence of like dialectic. Di- dialectic is necessary; is a necessary part of logic. Jordan Peterson is not logical. That's why he has to talk so fast. <laughs> yeah, you, you get bamboozled. Like being a good arguer is not being a good logician. Mm-hmm. No. <laughs> yeah. So I think it is a fallacy to throw out... Lo- you know, I can understand why people have... You know, I've heard it being said that I think therefore I am is a, is a racist concept because people believe that primitive people didn't think and therefore... You know, and I understand that. But I think that this is a misunderstanding of what that the intention of the phrase was and obviously there's a huge amount of context you know that has subsequently been arranged around that and I can totally understand it but we have to try to actually use proper logic to understand that a lot of right-wing interventions that are casting themselves as logical just aren't you know we've talked about Peterson talking about fucking lobsters and if you have any if you have any notion of the unconscious or any 20th century thought it's patently ridiculous. Mm. So, and also, you know, the against logic, that is, you know, that's the highway to fascism in and of itself. You know, the new age, <laughs> I always say, scratch and I'm a therapist, you find a fascist. You know, without a bit, logic is a, um, you know, it's very, we, we are fallible beings as humans. We have uh, weird drives, weird compulsions. We have an unconscious that we can't control. So it's very difficult to manipulate logic, but, a lack of logic is the highway to fascism and fascism emerges at times when we like can't understand. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, like hippie, hippie is well, not... Well, you're duped into thinking that you have authority. Yes. And it's almost like ide- ideology emerges when there aren't proper answers and it's this like narrative story. But the more uncertain we are as humans, the more we tend to cling to certainty. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so... You know, this cliche of a hippie fascist is not, it's not a cliche, it's cliche for no reason, you know. Yeah. And also Peterson talked about that there's no notion of nature on Marx's work. Mm -hmm. And I just think that it's very important to remember that from a psychoanalytic perspective, humanity is a hiccup. Yeah. Uh, It's it's an ontological hiccup Mm -hmm. that uh, represents sort of like... You know, there's there's a life goes into death all of the time, mm-hmm. and temporality gets inserted into that. And mm-hmm. it's a he, she talks Zipanchi talks about it as a circuitous path that is paved by life drive, mm-hmm. but really, ultimately, the end is is is, is death. Mm-hmm. But 
it's it's sort of like an aberration or some kind of corruption mm -hmm. from like mm -hmm. natural process of life, mm -hmm. which is to return to an inorganic or inanimate yeah. state. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. And uh, I mean, which is about... why the whole lobster thing just doesn't. It, why I know we like, always talk about the lobster thing, but it's just like just just. Did, I don't know if you mentioned in the podcast already the idea that I I heard one time when um, I think it was uh, Brett Weinstein who is the the Evergreen College guy. Did you hear about this? It's, who's like a he's like an evolutionary psychologist, and he was at this um, college that has like a it was mm -hmm. like a it might have been in Black History Month or something, but it was like no white people were allowed to come to. I'm not exactly sure what happened, but oh, kind of like know. that Wonder Woman. Didn't Wonder Woman have a, have a premiere that there was no man allowed? Uh, or maybe it was Captain Marvel. That would be even that would be even better. Capitalism, people, capitalism. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. So he's an evolutionary psychologist, and he's been on the Joe Rogan podcast. And I heard him give an example about like, um, you know, it's like interesting to hear them try to like justify like sex and stuff. And um, it was about um, autoerotic asphyxiation and why that um, is a fetish for some people. Why some people are aroused by it and why some people get aroused when they hang, they're hanged. And the like justification from so that the notion of like sex and fetish and pleasure and masturbatory fantasy from like an evolutionary psychology perspective is like, well, there would have been somebody one time in history who um, like ejaculated just after they were dying. And it was like an impulse for the body that like wants to plant its seed one last time. Mm -hmm. Just not understanding that fantasy and like sexual fantasy is is like part of an aberration that's not natural yeah yeah but yeah. just that that, that that like explanation is just like absolutely nuts <laughs> but this is the point like people think that that's logic that's not logic that's lack of education yeah yeah so any any other thoughts on the on the debate you know um i I'm really glad that Peterson, uh, that Peterson, ha ha ha, that was the Freudian slip, maybe I'm a, a secret Peterson admirer. No, I'm really glad that uh, Zizek did it. I do worry that, um, you know, it, it might be certain new followers of Zizek who have historically taken a different position might give uh, an opportunity to liberals to uh, point their finger and call Zizek a fascist or a right winger or something and um, I hope that doesn't happen <laughs> um, well, but then maybe it happened. probably did, will happen yeah. did you see that, that Jacobin uh, article that came out no sort of like dissecting the debate but mm -hmm. they were practically just saying that like Zizek has so much in common with Peterson already that mm -hmm. he's becoming sort of like a, a liberal and liberal in the classic sense mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and um, yeah it's just I don't I mean I don't understand the hate um it's yeah, it's almost like Zizek is providing a solution and we don't want a solution. Of course, it's not like this center of debate, mm -hmm. of the debate, like... Uh, debate sorry, of the century. Yeah, <laughs> what the fuck? Yeah, uh, debate of the century, you know, even they were kind of laughing mm -hmm. about it on mm -hmm. stage. It's just like, you know, okay, this is not really it. Mm -hmm. But the possibility of both of them talking to each other mm -hmm. and, you know, like you were saying, like, there's this there's this primacy of like logic and, and reason and really there's no excuses at, mm -hmm. at that point it's just if you are if you're prepared mm -hmm. if you're proficient in logic if you're proficient in, in reasoning it's gonna show mm -hmm. and it definitely showed that peterson was really out of his depth yeah and i don't think that it could have gone really any other way yeah um I really, I don't know if we talked about this before uh, the recording ended uh, last time, but I really liked the point when Zizek asks Peterson um, to name one oh, yeah. postmodern Marxist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, like, question mark, postmodern Marxist. Like, what? Yeah. Um, and didn't he mention Foucault and stuff? And, like, not yeah. knowing that, like, Foucault is, like, completely anti Marx. Mm -hmm. Um yeah <laughs> but um but i think you know one of the reasons why i was really glad it happened is the you know traditional european leftists need to um reclaim the terms um because you know when we, we there's a podcast that we'll release um soon that we recorded with the author todd mcgowan 
talking about how um, in under neoliberalism, lots of kind of notions and traditional notions have been scrambled that like now actually something like the police uh, are kind of like against capitalism almost that like you see this in Blade Runner 2049. Um, like corporation versus police um, and the state isn't necessarily as capitalistic as it used to, you know as in it's not like all these things that we have like as cliche notions are being scrambled and terms are being thrown around so like cultural marx um you know marxist or leftist uh with a you know that, that are associated with certain terms these days are just not that so when someone says a marxist maybe from a, like a peterson or slightly more conservative position they mean a liberal and they mean mm. a, like a neoliberal or like a neoliberal identitarian rather than a right-wing identitarian. They don't mean Marxist. Mm -hmm. And I hope it was made clear that um, a Marx isn't the cult, the Marx, the communist manifest manifesto. I mean, it's just a completely ridiculous fallacy to take one text from one given time written for a specific purpose to be like, this is everything like, Unless you've read Capital, I'm sorry. Like, yeah. <laughs> no. Um, Would you say that this is... Has anything really like this happened before? Historically. Since maybe Chomsky versus Foucault? In the... I think it was the 70s. I'm not sure. I did, Chomsky's an interesting one. That's a whole different kettle of fish yeah no i'm not saying that they're like mm -hmm. great you know amazing mm -hmm. thinkers that i agree with or yeah. whatever but it's just you know they're very they're public intellectuals yeah you know? i mean it's interesting like is like peterson is a youtube intellectual you know so i think it's like a different era i don't know if he's like a public intellectual but definitely a youtube intellectual well i mean um, it's kind of do it's the same mean, thing? Well, maybe. I mean, like, I guess, like, yeah, P Camille Pally would be like a public intellectual. Well, YouTube, you? I think YouTube is just like public, public domain, but yeah, with stats. Yeah, yeah so. that's true. That's true. No, I don't know if there's anything else to say, really. We had, we, as I said, we'd recorded <laughs> the whole spiel that um, wasn't recorded. So maybe there are a few gems that we just, <laughs> probably not. But any, <laughs> any other thoughts? Um... No, I don't think so. If I remember anything, I'll mention it in a, in a following episode. Another episode. Yeah. Yeah, but basically, it's good that it happened. Uh, it's good that, uh, like, a European continentally minded Marx, Marx, Hegel, Hegel Freud type person mm -hmm. put their flag in the ground and claimed uh, a certain perspective that has been accused of being something that isn't. Um, I'm excited that other people will be finding Zizek I think it's an opportunity to spread his influence and um I kind of feel embarrassed for Peterson I kind of feel bad yeah. but um yeah, although he seemed kind of um he seemed, seemed graceful it. yeah in admitting yeah. sort of like the a very obvious defeat uh, yeah. and uh yeah and like as you know, Peterson is just doing, so, you know, you have to like blame blame the system, not the symptom, you know, and like, why has Peterson emerged at this time? And like, what is he trying to cover over or respond to and what is lacking? Well, it's just another iteration of the figure of the Jew, you know, it's mm -hmm. just, you know, to him, his whole thing is just based on like the antagonization of postmodern yeah. cultural Marxists. Mm -hmm. And that's obviously has mm -hmm. like a... Like a Jewish background to it. Yeah, I mean, exactly. But it's funny, it's like toxic masculinity. It's almost like toxic masculinity is like just a displacement of capitalism. And that's the other thing. Yeah. I mean, it's just very, it's very fashionable right now to say that individual choices can change the pan the, the, mm -hmm. the political panorama mm -hmm. that we mm -hmm. live in. Mm -hmm. And I think he's all about that. Yeah, I think he's, he's definitely all about like taking responsibility, like the fallacy of taking responsibility. Yeah. yeah. But it's an interesting one, and he's an interesting figure, and we will no doubt be talking about him again. I, I do find him endlessly fascinating, I must say. In a masochistic way. In a masochistic and an annoyment way. <laughs> anyway, uh, well, there you go. Thanks for listening. All right. And uh, I was just going to say, see you next time, but that's not true. <laughs> Speak to you next time. Speak to you next time. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>